When I graduated from high school and decided to go to Houghton, I can remember very distinctly sitting in the financial aid officer's office and them saying, if you just sign on this line, basically saying, if you just sign on this line, the government will give you all this money so you can go to college here. I'm like, great, <laughs> sign me up. They don't tell you at all. You know, you're 18 years old sitting in this office. They don't tell you at all what it's like four years later when you get out and then are faced with the reality of having to pay that. And then I went right from Houghton to seminary and accrued more student loan debt and still wasn't wise enough or the common sense enough to really realize the implications of it. You just sign the line, they give you money, and you, you get your degree. When I came out of seminary, I was a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for basically 25 years. Youth pastors don't get paid much. And I was in an economically depressed area in town, and I did not get paid much. I was making peanuts, to tell you the truth, and it did not take long to realize the implications of making those student loan payments. My wife and I had three daughters inside of uh, four years. We were one of those couples that said, we're going to wait three to five years before we have kids. And my wife got pregnant on our honeymoon. And about every 18 months after that, we had a child. So we had three kids inside of four years. My wife was staying at home with them, and I was working as an underpaid youth pastor, to tell you the truth. You know, nobody goes into ministry for the money, and nor did I. That was not my goal or desire. But the reality of life is I had bills to pay and a family to support, and it was very difficult. It was very difficult. <clears throat> In my private times with the Lord, I just began to cry out to him, God, you're a God of deliverance. Could you deliver us from this debt? Yes, I'm sure I took it on unwisely and unknowingly and not knowing the implications, but you're a God of grace and mercy and deliverance. Would you deliver us from this debt? And one morning in my devotional time, I thought I heard God tell me, yes, I will deliver you of this debt. I'm like, really? And you always ask, did I just really hear that? Was that the pizza I ate last night, or did I really hear that? So I went and I kind of submitted this to some of the wise Christian gentlemen that I knew. You know, I thought I heard this from God. Is that something that God would do? And none of them had a check in their spirit. They all thought, yeah, God's a God of deliverance, and we'll stand with you if you want to believe that this is what God has said. And I honestly believe that I heard God. So I felt like I had no choice. Either I had to say, yeah, God said this, or no, he didn't. And I felt that he did, so I had no choice to believe it. And I decided to put my faith behind it, that God is going to deliver us from our debt. My wife and I began living like we believed that was true. And we kind of had this fun, happy little routine where every day we went to the mailbox, we would say to each other, maybe today's the day. We were expecting anonymous, anonymous checks to show up in the mail, bags of money to drop out of heaven on our front porch, or some such thing. We were really believing for a check to show up on our mailbox. And every day we'd say to each other, maybe this is the day. Maybe this is the day that God's going to fulfill his promise. A couple of years went by of carrying that promise. One day I get a letter in the mail from the company that holds my student loan. I open up the letter, and it's our promissory note, the note that's the record of what we owe. In the middle of this, stamped in red, it says, paid in full on our promissory note. And we're like, what? Somebody paid off our debt. We are literally freaking out. We are dancing and jumping and shouting and singing with arms raised in the sky, saying, God fulfilled his promise to us. He paid off our debt. We called our parents, and not all of them are Christians, and we kind of did a, see, we told you God was faithful, and he did this thing. After doing all of that, we had the thought, you know, maybe we should just call and check and confirm this. We call the company that owns our loan to find out that company sold our loan to another debt company. We owe the same amount of money to this company over here. They did not mention that in the promissory note. Isn't that terrible? This company was paid off. They were paid in full. But we owe the same amount of money to another company, and they didn't tell us. We were heartbroken. We were crestfallen. We had to call our unbelieving parents and say, 
man, this wasn't it, but we're still carrying the promise. And this was the first test. I had to ask myself, did God speak or did God not speak? I believed God has spoke, had spoken. And it simply became, it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what my eyes see or what my heart feels. Did God speak? And I said, yeah, I'm sure he did. It didn't change the promise. I have no doubt that this was the first in a series of texts from the evil one to get us to give up on the promise. I have no doubt of that. My strongest spiritual gift is faith. And by God's grace, I was able to tap into that and realize this has nothing to do with God spoke. It doesn't matter if my house burns down or we get wiped away by a flood. What my eyes see, what my heart feels, doesn't matter. Did God speak? Yes, he did. The promise goes on. We continued living. A couple years later, four or six years into this promise process, I had an unfortunate uh, job change. My already meager salary was cut by about a third, and we could no longer make the payments on our student loan. Now, there is a provision in student loan payments that you can go, what's, go on what's called hardship deferment, which means you no longer have to make payments, but the interest keeps accruing as you go on. I mean, it, it is nice of them that okay, they don't default you. It doesn't hurt your credit. They allow you to, make, uh, to not make payments, but they still stick it to you, and they increase the, uh, the interest keeps accruing. In the five years we were on hardship deferment, our student loan debt grew from $22,000, oh, excuse me, it started at $27,000, our, our debt. During the time we were paying it, we paid it down to $22,000. In the five years we were on hardship deferment, it grew from $22,000 to $32,000. $5,000 more than we started with. And again, my first reaction is, God, what gives? You remember I'm carrying this promise, right? But we had a short season of discouragement and trying to find God's heart again and tapping into that faith promise. And I had the same discussion with myself. You know what? This does not matter. What my eyes see, what my heart feels does not matter. The circumstances don't matter. Did God speak? Yeah, I still believe God spoke. We went on carrying the promise and went on living. A couple years later, I kind of had the idea, I've always been um, pretty intelligent. I don't say that to pat myself on the back. I've always done really well in school, test really high on IQ tests, on, on, on. Always did really well. Uh, and I've always enjoyed game shows of all kinds, particularly trivia-based game shows, kind of reflective of knowledge. I had the thought, you know what, maybe I should try to get on a game show. I felt a little uneasy. It kind of reminded me of the Hagar story in Scripture. God promises Abraham that Abraham and Sarah are going to have a kid. But it kind of doesn't happen fast enough, and Abraham and Sarah are getting old, and they figure out, man, if I don't do something to make God's promise happen, maybe this isn't ha going to happen. So Sarah says to Abraham, hey, take my servant Hagar and produce us a child. And he does, and they have a child, and kind of everything goes wrong. You know, Ishmael becomes the head of a, of a tribe that becomes a competitor with the Israelites, on and on. And he kind of tried to force God's hand himself. And I had to weigh this discussion in my head. You know, is using my gifts and my talents and kind of working towards this promise, is that really faith? Or should I just be waiting for bags of money to fall out of heaven and checks to show up in my mailbox? I had a short season of wrestling with that, and I really felt like it was not only okay, but it's good for saints of God to use their gifts, to co-labor with God, to make stuff on earth happen. And that really is kind of a theme of all of the gospel. There's a mystery between stuff that God does and stuff that he empowers and asks people to do. And it kind of meets in the middle that it's God and it's humans co-laboring together to see his will and his kingdom established on the earth. And I really felt peace about it that he had gifted me with this strong mind and it was fine to look for ways where I could make this happen or see the promise fulfilled. So I started applying for various game shows. When Who Wants to Be a Millionaire first came out, anyone ever watched that show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Easily three quarters of the people here. 
When it first came out, geez, 20 years ago, it was Regis Philbin in the evening they had it. When it went into syndication, the first host was Meredith Vieira, and it went from being at 8 o'clock in the evening to like 5 o'clock in the late afternoon. But this was during the Regis Philbin era. To get on the show, it started, you had to call a number. You would have to answer three trivia questions, no, five trivia questions over the phone, and you'd have to answer by pushing numbers on the phone thing. If you got all five of those questions right, you got put into a pool, and some number of people would randomly get a phone call the next day to be on the show. So you know, I probably tried this a dozen of times, watching the show every night, and every night I'm calling in and answering the questions, and I don't know, 70% of the time I got all five questions right and got put into the pool, didn't get a call back. Maybe 30% of the time I missed one of the five, something like that. Well, one Saturday, I'm trying out, calling in, get all questions right, hang up. I don't think about it because I've done this 47,000 times before this. The next day, we go to church. It's a Sunday. We go to church. We come back from church. The answering machine is blinking twice. We have two phone calls. We press it. The first message says, this is Sarah from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You need to be home to take the qualifying phone call or you're disqualified and get put back into the pool. We're like, oh no. It says, we'll call back one more time. Guess what the second message says? This is Sarah from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? I'm sorry you've been disqualified from this round and you're put back into the pool. My wife and I look at each other and we're like, we were at church! God, we were at church! You knew this was going to happen. We were at church! This was the call to get on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And we were at church. My wife was crying. She was, she was just heartbroken. She was sobbing. Well, crying. I was disappointed. I mean, I was discouraged, disappointed. And you, you have that whole discussion again of, God, what gives? And pretty close to immediately, by God's grace, my faith kicked in again. Same old discussion. Circumstances don't matter. Doesn't matter what my eyes see. Doesn't matter what my heart feels. Did God speak? Yeah, God, I believe you spoke. It's been eight years. I still believe you spoke. I'm going to go back and trust in, and trusting you. You're a faithful God. You're true. I'm going to trust you. It doesn't matter what happens. I know this is number three in Satan's attack to discourage us and keep us from holding on to God's promise. And I went back to trusting God and believing Him. During this time, by really God's grace and mercy and by some amazing circumstances, we were able to buy our first house, which was no small feat given my salary. We spent years looking at houses. The things we liked, couldn't afford, the things I could afford, you wouldn't want to put a family of dogs in. And I'm, I'm not trying to be cruel to anyone's housing at that time, but it was, it was just a fact. Run down things that really weren't fit for family. That's reflective of how uh, meager my salary was and the kind of homes we can't afford. I had entered a season of life where I left full-time ministry to go work as a personal aide with a brain-injured man because... The family of this brain-injured man, very devout Catholics, they knew me casually. They contacted me and personally asked me if I would become one of the aides for their son who had round-the-clock care. I was uh, just very honored and blessed that they thought that highly of me, and they wanted someone that was kind and gracious and compassionate to work with their son that needed round-the-clock care. Spent a real short season, a couple of days a week, praying about it, and just felt in my heart that that was as much ministry as ministering in a church, showing that kind of compassion and love for you know, the downtrodden and the poor, the oppressed and widows and orphans and the disabled, all the people that God loves, especially in Scripture. And I just felt like, yeah, this is what God wants me to do for this season. And I worked with that gentleman for about five years, being his uh, personal aid, and I'm going to tell you more about their story in another message. Towards the end of my time there, 
their family didn't even know that we were looking for a house. They had no idea we were looking for a house. We really didn't tell anyone. It wasn't like a thing. We weren't asking people to pray or anything. We were just looking for a house. No one really knew it. They owned a house uh, right in the heart of our small town that their other daughter lived in. Their daughter got married and went to live at her husband's house, and this house was now became available. Before they put the house on the market, they offered it to my wife and I for 20000 less than the market price. It was the exact, down to the dollar, the exact figure we could afford on a house. They didn't know that. They had no idea the exact figure. And it was a beautiful house with a large fenced-in yard for my kids and our two Pomeranians that we ended up getting, great garage, nice driveway, uh, walking distance to everything, the hospital, the movie theater, the bank, the mini mart. It was, just, it was such an incredible blessing and as much the hand of God that anything else that happened in this story that I'm telling. We qualified for pretty much every house buying initiative that was out there we were in an economically depressed area, which gave us some stuff. We were first-time home buyers, which gave us some stuff. And we were low income, which gave us some stuff. Our house payment, our taxes, and insurance together was $440 a month on this lovely house. And any of you that own a property, you know that is borderline miracle range to have a nice house and be paying that much on a house a month. It was an incredible blessing, and we ended up living there for uh, 15 years or something. It was one of the biggest struggles when we made the decision to leave Sarah, Pennsylvania and move to Rochester was we loved our house. It was, it was such a blessing, uh, but we did end up uh, doing that. During this time of trying to get on this game show, I had another round of faith discussions with God. He had promised me he was going to take care of our student loan debt, I began holding before him. I said, God, you've provided this wonderful house for us. I clearly see your hand in how we got this, and you're so gracious and faithful and kind. Thank you for this house. God, we have this mortgage now, and we're making this uh, payment every month. We're making it. We're doing it faithfully. It's, it's difficult. It's not unbearable. You're faithful. You're providing day to day. Lord, would you, de would you deliver us from this mortgage as well? I can't say I heard from God specifically like I did with the student loan debt that yeah, who's going to do it. It's a little hard to explain, but my faith just grew. And you know that it says in um, Hebrews 11.1 1, that faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hopes for, the evidence of things not seen. I can only explain it as I, I had evidence in my spirit of something that had not yet been seen. God birthed something to me. It's like he birthed a paid off house in my spirit. Even though I didn't hear him speak it to me, he birthed faith for it in my heart. And unless you've experienced that, it's a little, it's a little hard to explain. And again, the fact that faith is my strongest spiritual gift, I don't know if that gives me a little bit of, of advantage, but it just kind of made sense. I felt this thing birthed in me, this evidence of things not seen that I could claim by faith. Didn't see it yet in, the, in reality, but my eyes of faith saw it, and I could claim it. You know, you, you don't know me all that well, but I hope you realize I am not a prosperity gospel guy. I'm not a name and claim it guy. I'm not a claim your Cadillac and you get your Cadillac from God. It's not, it's not, it really wasn't that at all. But in this instance, it was just God's grace in empowering my faith to believe in this specific situation that he might do this. So my faith grew from paying off our student loan debt to paying off all of our debt. And I began to hold that before the Lord and I guess kind of claim it by faith because he had birthed that in my heart. To pay off our student loan debt and our house, we would have to win uh, $250,000 uh, 
on whatever game show we got on. Because after tithe and taxes, we figured out that we'd be walking home with about $150,000. Yeah, taxes take a lot. You don't really think about that when you get on a game show. We were happy and thrilled to give 10% to a church, but then uh, the state and the government took a big chunk of it. So we realized we'd have to come home with $150,000 and that was a lot more than our uh, debt, our, our house debt and our student loan debt. But on Millionaire, there was nothing else between, it's either 64,000 at the time, which wasn't enough, and, or I'm sorry, either 125,000, which wasn't enough, or $250,000, which was enough and more. So we had to get uh, the 250,000 after taxes and tithes, they have enough to pay those off, but it would have given us some more as well. Okay. We're 10 years into this process, 10 years of carrying this promise and God still being faithful of us providing for us in our meager income, and I'm still carrying this promise from God. Lo and behold, a uh, millionaire goes into syndication. Regis Philbin is no longer the host. It's Meredith Vieira's first season as host, and they change the tryout process. Now it's no longer a phone thing. Now they're traveling around the country doing in-person tryouts. I find out the night before, at like 9 o'clock in the evening, my sister, who lives a half hour away, calls me at 9 p.m. and says, did you see that Millionaire is having a tryout at the Arnott Mall in Horsehead's Big Flats? Some of you probably know where that is. We live a half hour down, we lived half hour down the road in Waverly, New York, and Sarah, Pennsylvania, across the road. Nine o'clock at night, she calls me for a 7 a.m. tryout the next morning. I'm like, no, I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear anything. I was, thankfully, I was free the next morning. I got up at like 5 a.m. to get to the tryout site at 6 a.m., and I was already about the 500th person in line of people waiting in line to go in and take this tryout. They're calling people in 75 at a time to sit in a room, and take a written test and then be interviewed to see how you perform on TV. So I'm about 500th in line and about you know, six groups of 75 go in and after about an hour, I finally get in. I take the test. They don't tell you how you do on the test. They don't tell you what the qualifying score is. They don't tell you uh, how you did on the test. There was a 30 question test. It wasn't multiple choice. You had to either know the answers or you didn't. I knew that I knew about 27 out of the 30. Two or three I wasn't sure of. One I had no idea and figured I, I'd missed it. But I'm thinking, yeah, I'm probably going to get 25 or 27 of these right. That's got to be above the qualifying score, doesn't it? But again, you, you, you leave and you don't know. I go through my interview. I thought the interview went uh, really well, but I found out later it didn't go as well as I thought it did. I can't remember all the questions they asked, but they asked, you know, what's the most surprising or, or craziest thing about you that would be you know, surprising to someone? And I told them the story. If you've ever seen the back of my head, which is a little easier now that all the hair is gone, it wasn't always so easy to see, but it's not so easy because I'm six foot three. So if you come up to here, you might not see it. But if I ever bend over, you'll see. There's a couple of scars on the back of my head. There's a big knob on the back and things that look like finger marks around it. Well, they are finger marks. When I was born, my hand was attached to my head like this. They had grown together, and I came out of the womb like this. And I still have uh, the scar on it. I have, I've had a couple men of God uh, speak into my life over the years and say things like, you know, the Lord's hand has been upon you. And I've really taken that very personally and preciously. It just reminds me of being born like this. The doctor that uh, delivered me said that I was the second baby he had, had seen like that. So in the thousand babies that he delivered, he had seen two. But it was kind of a unique thing. And yeah, if you want to see it later, I'll let you. And for, for a quarter, I'll let you touch it if you want. So, so I'm sharing this story and thinking, oh wow, this is going to make me stand out. As you know, I eventually got on the show I found out from the show producers, they told me, you almost blew it with that story. That was too far out there. You're, they said, your selling point is you're just like an average Joe 
schlucking through life and paying your bills. And that's kind of your shtick, they told me. And they really said, yeah, you really kind of got out of your lane with that story. We almost didn't take you because of that. Here I thought it was the thing that was going to make me stand out, but uh, they did take me. So that was in December. I tr- no, I'm sorry. It was in November that I tried out. A month later, I get a call to be on Who Wants to Be a, be a Millionaire? And you're like, your, your knees are shaking. You're on the phone like, you're coming to Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And you're like, really? The promise still isn't fulfilled. i got to get on there and i got to produce now. i got to know some stuff and get on there and answer some questions. But again, my faith is uh, starting to grow. Who Wants to Be a Millionaire uh, tapes at that time in New York City at the ABC offices in uh, downtown New York City. This is before I had injured my back. This was 16 years ago in 2003 that I got on the show. So I didn't have any trouble traveling there. Now traveling is very difficult for me, but I got, I got there and got on the show. The morning of the show, you know, I'm getting up, I'm getting ready to go report to the studio. I'm trying to be delicate here. I'm indisposed, taking care of the, the morning business, and I'm just feeling very anxious all of a sudden. And that really, it's not like me, but I guess it, it's kind of normal for first time being on TV and being on a game show and that whole thing. I'm just sitting there, I'm, I'm kind of anxious. And from the bathroom, I call out to my wife, and say, honey, I'm really, I'm really starting to feel it, and you know this isn't like me. Can you just please pray for me? And she started praying, and she felt she heard specifically from God Isaiah 41.10. That's what she heard. We didn't really even know what the verse said. She thought she heard Isaiah 41.10. So she went and got the Bible, and she opened it up, and she read it to me. And it's become one of my favorite verses, to tell you the truth. And it says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isn't that the perfect verse for that kind of situation? Isn't that God's mercy and goodness and kindness? And I just felt this peace come over me. The, the, uh, the nervousness almost completely washed away. Again, it's hard to explain. It, it's a, it's a, sp- a spiritual transaction happened. God was faithful and answered, and I just felt good and kind of in the zone. Still had no idea if this was going to be it, if I was going to win the $250,000 or not, but I just felt good. When I got on the show, it's funny, if you know me behind the scenes, I'm, I'm kind of like the raucous, charismatic, joking, life of the party kind of guy, joking around, humor, blah, blah, blah kind of guy. I got so much ribbing from my friends because I was like almost, I was so in the zone when I was in that chair answering questions. It was like completely not my personality. And all my friends and family were like, Jeff, what the heck? Show some personality. Have some fun. But this is very much me. I'm an in the zone kind of guy. When there's something to be done, I'm like in the zone. And there was so much riding on this, I was in the zone. And my kind of humor, wacky personality kind of went out out uh, the door. I want to show you the final two questions that I answered correctly. And me and the gentleman spent some time trying to figure this out, and hopefully this will work. Oh my gosh, I was telling Reg I can hardly read the right button. Okay, I think I see the one that says blank. <laughs> does that say blank above that button? Yes, okay. it does. Sorry about that. I thought I had it figured out. I'm at the age where I need reading glasses for most uh, things. I was telling Reg, when I print my notes out for my sermon, I use like 18 or 24 fonts, so I don't need my glasses. But here I got undone by something that wasn't in 18 or 24 font. All right, I had just answered the $64,000 question correctly, and now it's going to show the next two questions. Is my wife? You're going for 125,000 here, Jeff. One lifeline left. What author wrote six romantic novels under the pseudonym Mary Westmacott? Lillian Hellman, Agatha Christie, Virginia Woolf, Gertrude Stein. 
I have absolutely no idea, so let's start with the 50-50. You get three okay. lifelines, I use the 50-50, they take two answers. Two of the wrong answers, leaving one wrong answer, and obviously the correct one. Six romantic novels under this pseudonym. Mary Westmacott. Are you a gambling guy? No, not really. Yeah. I've been playing the situation over in my head for a, a while. I'm going to say Agatha Christie, final answer. You know what, Jeff? When you get done paving your driveway, you can pave your whole town. You've got 125. I told them I wanted to repave my driveway. Is what I wanted to do with spending the money. Pennsylvania, you just showed how brave you are, or maybe how crazy you are. You just guessed that one. Yes, it was. It was a guess. That was a huge gamble, though. Absolutely. And you had uh, said you're not a gambler. I'm not, no. So what provoked you? Uh, the prospect of getting it right, I guess. <laughs> so. Well, I was watching Kathy's face, and Kathy, I, you didn't seem too happy. Oh, no, I, I trust his instinct. You do? Okay. I do, but it, but it was scary. I was on the edge of my seat there. Well, listen. You're three questions away from winning a million dollars. Amazing. You're going for $250,000, Jeff. No lifelines, but that's okay. You did that one on a guess? I ain't guessing again. Oh, you ain't? Okay, we'll see about that. Let's play. <laughs> Nineveh was a capital city of what ancient empire? Wait. Aztec, Assyrian, Mayan, Phoenician. The answer is B, Assyrian, final answer. Well, obviously you knew it. You got it right for 250,000. All right, you guys shut it off. Thank you. All right, you guys are already laughing at the joke in this, which I want, I want to tell you about. All right, two things. On that question why I took the 50-50 and then guessed, I, there's one thing I regret about uh, my experience there. As I take the 50-50 and I'm thinking, I really still don't have any idea. Do I kind of take an educated guess or do I walk away? If you miss a question, if you're above $32,000, you can't drop below 32. If you're below 32 and you miss a question, you drop down to nothing. I was above $32,000. If I got it wrong, I'd be uh, down to 32 which wasn't enough. Like I said, we needed 250 for God to uh, fulfill his promise to us. So I'm just sitting there thinking about what to do. And I had played the situation over my head. You know, how much am I willing to risk? And at what point? And what am I going to do? In that moment, I'm really a I'm asking God, God, what should I do? And I thought I heard God in that moment say as clearly as I've ever heard anything. I thought I heard him say, Jeff, you have my favor to guess. And I did, and I got it right. The only thing I, re I regret is when she asked me, why did you do that? And I answered, well, the prospect of getting it right. In the spur of the moment, I don't know if I crumbled or what. I wish I had said, you know what? I was just talking to God, and I thought I heard him say I have his favor to guess. So I, I really regret that. But that, is, that is the truth. I heard God say, you have my favor to guess. And so I guessed, and I got it right. The $250,000 question pops up. Nineveh was the capital of what ancient empire? When I answered this correctly, everyone behind the scenes, the producers, the other contestants, are saying, how did you know this? We had no idea. I was a Bible major at Houghton. <laughs> Jonah is from Nineveh. That's a Nineveh story. I knew Nineveh was the capital of Assyria probably since fourth grade Sunday school. This was such God's smile of approval on the exact dollar amount I needed to give me a question that was completely, utterly reflective of my skill set, my knowledge, my gifting. I could have laughed out loud in the chair, but I was so thrown. I'm sitting there in the chair and I'm thinking to myself, this is too easy. I'm missing something. I'm missing something. And I read the question three times. They can't be asking this. There's got to be something I'm missing here. I'm like, no, that's what they're asking. And that's when I say with confidence, the answer is Nineveh. 
and then you notice uh, Meredith say, well, you obviously knew that one. Yeah. The next question I did not know, and the final option in Millionaire is you can stop at any time with the money you have accrued at that time. The next question was, um, what fruit smells so bad that it's illegal to take it on the subways in Singapore? Anybody have a guess? If you've been on the mission field, you might know this. Durian. Who said that? Durian is correct. It's a fruit called durian. When you cut durian open, they say it smells like a combination of rotten eggs and decaying flesh, believe it or not. And people in Southeast Asia eat it. The ironic thing is, my best friend back home was a missionary. I get home, he says, Jeff, I've got durian in my fridge right now. Oh, man, I didn't know it. And the other kind of funny thing, I didn't really lose any sleep over this, but it's kind of funny. I really studied a lot to beef up my knowledge to get on these shows. I'm going to talk about that more on Wednesday. But as I subsequently went back over some of the stuff that I had studying, my process for studying is read stuff, highlight the important stuff as I read, and then go back and review the stuff I've highlighted. After the show, I just happened to be flipping through one of the books that I had read and highlighted, and I had durian highlighted. Durian, a smelly fruit I had, I had highlighted. And for, what re and for, for whatever reason, in that moment, I, had never, I felt, thought I had never heard of it. I just had no conception of it whatsoever. But again, I, I, I'm not complaining. We got the exact amount of money for God to fulfill his promise. So we went home with a check for, well, actually, it was like four months later, you get a check in the mail for $250,000. That's a head trip. Anyone here ever get a check in the mail for $250,000? That was a, I mean, you're just, I'm just overwhelmed with awe and thanksgiving at God's goodness. So we gave our tithe, gave... Nineveh is in Iraq. And the name of it now is? Fred. I don't know. Mosul. Mosul. Great. And that was very prominent during the Iraq War, Mosul. I didn't realize that was Nineveh. And someone else went to Nineveh. Who was that? Um, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Uh, Nahum. Right. All right. Was that the $64,000 question? No. Where's your checkbook? No. So we uh, tithed to our church, paid our taxes, went home with $150,000, paid off our house, paid off our student loan, bought a used minivan, did get our driveway paved, and we took a family vacation to Disney World, which, if again, if you know my family, we just didn't do stuff like that. For 15 years, vacation for us was to go to Canandaigua to my in-laws' property and be with them. That was vacation for us. So it was an immense blessing getting to go to um, Disney World. We have been completely and entirely debt-free ever since then for the last 16 years. Yeah, you're not kidding. We pay our credit card off every month. I've never paid a nickel in credit card interest in 28 years of being married. We pay that off every month, and not only do we pay that off, we earn points for uh, using it, so they're paying me to use their credit card. It takes discipline, but you can do it, to pay that credit card off every month, and we use the money we accrue from that to like pay our insurance bill four times a year. We earn enough to pay our uh, house and car insurance. So we've been debt-free for 20 years. You know, I've run into a lot of people that say, oh, Jeff won $250,000, and 15 years later, they say, oh, wow, Jeff is rich. No, <laughs> I'm not rich. It was a specific deliverance of need. It went towards debt, and we still kind of went back to living week to week, but just without that, without that debt hanging over us and with a little more breathing room of not having to pay that debt anymore. It's been all the more incredible that for these last 14 years, I hurt my back 14 years ago, for about the first five to seven years after hurting my back, I was still able to work, but only work basically part-time. I slowly dwindled down to only being able to work half-time. When we moved to Rochester seven years ago and I re-injured my back, I haven't worked since then. I haven't been able to work. I can't help but see God's hand of mercy in that, that he knew all along that it wasn't even just about the debt at that time. He knew 
that we were going to need that space in that breathing room now for this season in life. We would not be making it on just my wife's salary if I couldn't work, if we still had that debt over our head. So I can, even, I can really see his hand in that um, also. All right, a couple of kind of things to sum up and then we'll be done. You know, the first thing that I, co- that I cogitate about and that it's, it's kind of a conundrum, but I'm really so thankful for this. Why 11 years? Why 11 years to see the fulfillment of the promise? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. From the day he told me he was going to take care of our debt, he could have dropped a bag of money on my front porch. He could have had, he could have stirred some rich person to send me an anonymous check in the mail. Why 11 years? Why the promissory note? Why the debt growing by $10,000 rather than shrinking? Why the kerfuffle with not getting on millionaire the first time because we missed the phone call? Why an 11-year process of heartache and having to keep faith? And if, if I'm as sure as anything in life, I'm sure that God is more interested in the process than he is the product. It would have been easy for him to write a check for $150,000 to me. But from God's perspective, there was more than just the money. I grew so much in faith those 11 years, learning to trust God in hard times, learning to trust God in the face of obstacles and heartache and discouragement, learning to hang on to a promise when God has spoken. It really changed me. It transformed me. I'm a different man of faith today than I would have been if I hadn't gone through that. You know, and there's a couple of prime examples of this in Scripture. If I've done the math right, and if some of the scholars I've read are correct, from the moment God told Noah to build the ark, it was 120 years before it started raining. God told Noah, build an ark. Noah believed God, did it built an ark, it took him 120 years, and 120 years later, it started raining, and the flood came. And that was 120 years of his neighbors thinking he was crazy, and mocking him, and accusing him, and oppressing him, and maligning him. And he held that promise for 120 years, and then the rain came. From the time that God told Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, it was 20 years before Isaac was born, before the child of promise was born, holding that promise for 20 years. And this is also one of my favorite passages in Scripture regarding um, faith from Romans 4, 18 and 22. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believe, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, hallelujah, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness did not waver in unbelief, but was fully persuaded. He knew the God of promise, and he vested his full hope and faith and trust in that promise and did not waver because of unbelief. Boy, processing that verse in the context of this deliverance transformed me, changed my faith. I'm a different man of God because of it. God showed himself true, and when God speaks something You can rest your life on it. Your very life, you can rest. I love the the twist that they put on Abraham's story in Hebrews 6.15. This is such a great and simple verse. And after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. It's almost presented as waiting is necessary to receive the promise. Because a spiritual transaction happens between you and God. And God is more interested in you as a person and as a child and as your character and as your life before him and conforming you to the image of his son 
than he is in maybe just healing you or maybe just having anonymous checks show up in your mail. And all of that stuff is great. And you know I believe that God is a God of the miraculous and a God of deliverance and he does stuff like this. But it's rarely going to happen as soon as we like it. And it might not happen the way that we're expecting because he is more interested in the man or woman of God that we become than if we just get the things that we're asking for. And you know God talks a lot about Scripture to come to Him with our needs, and He's a God that wants to meet our needs. But there's more to it than just getting those things met. Yeah, there's going to be times where you pray for someone's healing, and the first time you pray, they get well. Hallelujah! I believe in that stuff. You heard me say in the first couple of messages, I got faith to see a lot more of that kind of stuff, and I'm frustrated that I don't see more of it. But I'm going to keep praying for people until it happens. Sure, God immediately delivers, and sure, God immediately shows up. But I think that is more the exception than the norm. He'll do it, he can do it either way. Most of us know what it's like to go through seasons of caring promises or seasons of hardship, looking for God's provision and deliverance. But God is true. I also want to point out one last thing. I am, I am fully convinced that the 11 years we spent living paycheck to paycheck, and there was a season in that 11 years where our income was below the poverty level for a family of five. We were below the poverty level. Our entire life, we have paid every bill on time in every case, and my wife and I both have impeccable credit because of it. I see God's faithfulness and God's miraculous provision in that time of lack as much as deliverance and provision and miracle as the promise at the end. We lived hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck for a lot of years as a family of five, eating a lot of macaroni and cheese, eating a lot of hot dogs, taking vacations at my in-laws house. Uh, And my kids will tell you, they had no idea that we were poor. And I don't throw that word out lightly, but we were poor, (laughs) we were poor. They had no idea. We had a roof over our head. We never went without a meal. We had clothing, even if they were secondhand or thirdhand. But we didn't take glorious vacations, and we didn't have the best cell phone, and we didn't have the nicest cars and all this stuff. But our kids had no idea. They just felt loved and provided for, and my wife and I were living in faith behind the scenes and enjoying God's provision from week to week. And I am so thankful and so appreciative And I want to just loudly and proudly extol my God for his faithfulness during those time of want. And I have little doubt, you know, in Scripture it says in that one parable of the talents, because you are faithful with little, you will be faithful with much. I have no doubt that God had to test my heart of how I was going to handle money with little to trust me with a lot. And by his grace of provision, we were living by faith. We were faithful with little, and God blessed us being faithful with a lot. Reminds me of Philippians 4, this great passage where Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the secret. You can all quote this with me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the secret of contentment. Whether I have a little, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Whether I have a lot, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now, my challenge for you all My exhortation for you all, what are you holding before God in in terms of promise, in terms of breakthrough, in terms of deliverance? If you are only attempting stuff in life that you can do on your own, that you don't need God for, allow me to challenge you that you are not believing largely enough. You are not trusting God for enough. You are not risking enough. If you can make it through life and the things you've set your hand to, whether God shows up or not, you are not dreaming big enough. And if you are honest with yourself in your heart of hearts, 
I bet you, you have a dream from God percolating in your heart. Maybe he spoke it to you 50 years ago. Maybe he spoke it to you last week. Maybe it's about the salvation of a loved one. Maybe it's a financial breakthrough in your own life. Maybe it's a healing. Maybe it's a new job adventure you want to do. I bet you if you're honest with God, he's spoken to you a dream. If he hasn't, I would challenge you again, lovingly, if I may, as your brother in Christ. You're not talking to God enough about those things. I have no doubt that God wants to bless us in the areas of risk and adventure and need and provision a lot more than we dare to believe him and ask him for. What has God birthed in you? What goal? What dream? What has he spoken to you about? What obstacles and hardships have you seen along the way? Are you still holding on to that dream? Are you still pressing in? Are you still talking to him about what he does and what you do? Are you still talking to him about your faith and his goodness and your provision? What did he birth in you? If he hasn't, please enter a season of talking to him about the God who does far and above everything we can ask or think. Maybe it's you always wanted to be a missionary in Africa. Who knows what it is? That's between you and God. If you haven't talked to him about that yet, when you leave here today, start talking to him. I would love to hear your own stories, whether it's today or after you have three more days to talk to God about it. I would love to have you come up and say, God birthed this into me. I always wanted to be a ballerina, and I'm going to start pursuing that again today. I can tell this gentleman here wants to be a ballerina by his reaction. I mean, I could mention all sorts of silly, crazy, wild, unbelievable things. That's between you and God. I'd love to hear your stories. If you don't have a dream story yet, go ask God about doing bigger things than you've ever dared to believe Him. And I would love to hear what He tells you. If you are holding that dream before Him, that goal, keep the faith, my brothers and sisters. It is part and parcel of living in a fallen world that discouragement, obstacles, hardship, it's a daily part of life. And one of the biggest parts of life is finding God in the middle of the stuff and finding His faithfulness and keeping faith and keeping belief and keeping joy and keeping hope in the midst of it. I know some of you are trusting God for wayward children and all sorts of things. We've got to keep the faith. God is a God of the impossible, the miraculous. He's a God of deliverance. Whether or not you're carrying a specific word from him, if you are carrying a specific word from him, you know the answer. Has God spoken? When the trials of life come, that's the only thing that matters, and don't let anything shake your faith on that. If God has spoken, that is the only thing that matters, and your faith needs to tap into that. If you're not carrying a specific word from God, he still tells us to cry out to him until he answers. And we can cry out to him with faith and desperation and trust in his goodness because he doesn't want us to be under financial oppression. He doesn't want our children to be wayward. He doesn't want us to be um, physically ill and all that. And we can cry out to him until he answers. My desire today, very simply, was to exhort you to encourage your faith, to see anew and afresh the God who is true and faithful to his word, the God who does the miraculous, and let's trust him together. And we're going to see great kingdom stuff happen that affects your family, that affects your neighborhood, and hopefully affects your community and ultimately the world.